it's a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, Sara Bireti, she is the Executive Director, Center for Constitution of Governors. We also do have Robert Mugisa. He is uh, the Senior Programs Officer in Charge of Advocacy at the, uh, that is the Human Rights Center, Uganda. Also, Elliot Orizara, she is the Executive Director, that is Women and Girls Child Development Association. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me right here on this webinar. Thank you, Romeo, for hosting us. Thank you. All right. It's a wonderful conversation on the shrinking civic space within Uganda and the role of the civil society organizations, uh, especially now that we are seeing a clamp down on many of the uh, NGOs or CSOs within this country. Um, according to the uh, reports that have been coming in since 2016, we've been dealing with office brackets. I can't even take you back to the situation in October of 2020 because you are already acquainted, uh, Sarah, Robert and Elliot, about that issue that took center stage when the Financial Intelligence Authority across the accounts of, uh, that is the Uganda Women Network and also the Uganda National uh, NGO Forum in that regard. So we'd like to talk about why the government has continued to clap down on civil society organizations in this country. Sarah Biret, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you, Romeo, and uh, good afternoon, our mm. participants, once again. There is a misunderstanding or misconception mm. between mm. by government, which I think is intentional, mm. because the work of civil society is mandated in our constitution under the democratic principles. Mm. It is clearly stated that citizens are free to participate in the affairs of their governance through civic organizations. The same democratic principle states that civic organizations shall retain autonomy over their set objectives. Mm. And when you come under Article 38 of the constitution, mm. that's under our chapter four, the fundamental rights and freedoms. Mm. The same right is re-emphasized under Article 38 that citizens can participate in their affairs through either civic organizations or political organizations or as individuals. So beyond that, the government went ahead and enacted a special law for NGOs known as the NGO Act 2016. So that means that the work of civil society is clearly recognized right in the constitution, right in the laws of the country, and the, mis the, the misconception and, and blackmail is intentional mm. on the mm. part of the bearers. Because civil society is known as a third sphere in governance. You have mm. government, you have private sector, and you have civil society, also known as not for profit, or a sector that works to fight injustice, to fight mm. inequality, to make sure that the poor are not desperate enough to sell themselves and neither are the rich able to buy out to the poor. Mm. So the civil society comes in to create a balance and protect vulnerable groups. Mm. How we find ourselves at a collision, you know, course with the government mm. is really something that I wish participants could also help us understand mm. through their question and answer session. Because you have a sector, uh, uh, you know, created even before the constitution. You know, civil society is as old as mankind. It includes faith groups, which includes the church. It includes trade unions or labor, uh, labor movements. It includes farmers movements. You know, the broader civil society is as old as mankind itself. And civil society has worked over time as a voice of the people, fight evils, including slavery, mm. including apartheid, mm. including the civil rights movements in the US, yes, including sir. fighting you know, unfair wars. So this is the civil society that we are part of in Uganda. It seems like government is actually critical of those CSOs or NGOs in the sphere of accountability and governance. Why? Well, the more, the more government becomes undemocratic, the more they become uncomfortable with people calling them out to account, mm -hmm. with active citizens who are questioning the wrongs. There is no strong government that is scared of their people. Mm -hmm. 
But weak governments are scared of their people. Weak governments are scared of being called out to account. Weak governments are scared of active citizens who are questioning the wrongs. Mm. So that, that is the problem. And, and this is the juncture where we find ourselves at as a mm. country. The more the country loses, the government loses legitimacy, the more the regime becomes unpopular, the more oppressive it becomes against its citizens mm. gen in general. And those who are calling them out to account. Wow, that is Sara Bireti. She is the executive director for the Center for Constitutional Governance. She comes with a wealth of information on this same subject because I posted her a couple of times on my morning show, Morning at NTP. Thank you very much, Sara Bireti. Let me also bring in Robert Mugisa. Robert Mugisa is a senior programs officer in charge of advocacy at uh, the Human Rights Center, Uganda. Let's talk about human rights violations on the hands of government that are being meted out on civil society organizations. I'll take you back to 2016, Robert Mugisa award, when uh, many of the CSOs saw their offices being broken into. This is unlike uh, a behavior of the government. Go ahead, Robert Mugisa. Thank you very much, Romeo and uh, fellow panelists. Uh, we appreciate the time that we are in, mm. and also the fact that we are discussing a very pertinent issue right now, uh, the role of civil society and also uh, the narratives that surround civil society. Mm. I, myself and uh, fellow panelists have spent some time uh, in this uh, field of civil society work uh, when you talk about the violations that committed against civil society uh, by the state, uh, Sarah has just hinted on uh, a bit of why we feel like uh, much as we are nonpartisan, much as we are harmless, uh, still we find ourselves challenged in many ways. And one of those is uh, um, if you have followed the trend, uh, for example, we have the freezing of accounts called for, uh, and it's one of the way that uh, we could say our, our work is uh, infringed upon by the state. Mm. Uh, recently, yes, it Robert. was in December. Uh, it was in December when uh, uh, some organizations had their accounts frozen and we could not perform, we could not continue with our work. Uh, because of uh, the tagging that was uh, uh, given or the tagging that was done to these civil society organizations for supporting the electioneering process. That sounds like mm. we should not therefore speak about what we see in our environment. Uh, the other issue that uh, we see is the political rhetoric. Mm. Uh, you're talking about violations. Uh, uh, we, violations mm. are relating to what the state does to us as civil yes. society. Yes, Robert. Uh, Tagging us as uh, promoters, promoters of foreign interests is something that we have seen that has limited our space and therefore violated work as civil society. Mm -hmm. uh, using laws to curtail, uh, Sarah has talked about the NGO Act, but we have the Anti-Money Laundering Act these days. Mm -hmm. and when you look at the second schedule, uh, CSOs are non-profit organizations, not-for-profit organizations are tagged or labeled as um, accounting persons. But when you go into the strict sense of who an accounting person, we find that that is not necessary. We do not fall under that category. Mm. But government will say that uh, we are people or agents who promote terrorism, but where is the proof that we are promoting terrorism? And therefore, that is another way that... Um, our, clam uh, our work is clamped upon. So, so the meaning, other is uh, attacks. Meaning, meaning they use the issue of the terrorists and uh, you working with foreign agents to just clamp down on your work. That is the More truth. Like that is SPR, because SPR at campaign. the end of the day, when, when we are right. near campaign, when we are closed down, you find that um, you find that after a little while we are released without any, any charge uh, as civil society organizers. You find that they open up our work again but uh, actually there was nothing. It was about buying time. It was about mm -hmm. wasting our time. Uh, mm -hmm. We should have done productive work in our mandates. Mm -hmm. But because the government has a stronger hand that can limit us, they have limited us and we cannot uh, recover on what we have lost. 
Mm. Uh, the last one I could talk about is the break-ins and um, uh, the, the attacks that we face as civil society, mm. which I can again tag or, or quote as a, a violation of our work. I know violations relate more to people, but also mm. civil society work is infringed upon. Uh, right. Many times we see police, um, police coming into our premises and searching or instituting searches baseless searches that uh, probably we have information that they might need. Many times you find that uh, the information they're actually looking for is not with us because our work is very open. We work in very open spaces. Whatever we do, we publish uh, mm. to the public. We go on TV, we go into the media and say what we are feeling. Mm. So the more we speak, the more these people get scared of us. And many times we have fallen victim of mm. uh, our offices being broken into uh, over the last couple of years. That is Robert Mugisa. He is the senior programs officer in charge of advocacy at the Human Rights Center, Uganda. Let me also bring in Eliot Olizaro. Eliot Olizaro is the ED, Women and Girl Child Development Association. El Eliot Olizaro. here we are, government branding civil society actors as terrorists. But then guess what? These terrorists are moving up, you know, about in the city. No one is arresting them. You can even go to a shop and buy something. You can go to a hospital, get some services. They are free. How are you a terrorist and you're simply still on the streets moving and no one is arresting you? Do you know what would happen to you in Nigeria if you're being called a terrorist? Do you know what would happen to you if you are called a terrorist within the Central African Republic, within DRC, within Niger, within Mali? So why does the government continue to brand civil society actors as terrorists in this regard, yet you are doing the most when it comes to accountability and governance issues. Elliot. Well, thank you so much, Romeo. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah and Robert. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to start from uh, the question of how do I feel? Definitely, mm -hmm. I feel I feel unsafe. I Indeed. feel my, my fear increases every time when you call me terrorists. Mm. But uh, mm. I want to go back to uh, the year 2016 where you started with Sarah and Robert uh, mm. and, uh, and, and take it back to where I, I joined civil society here back in, mm. 20, uh, in, two, in 1999. Yes. 1999, 8th of December. And I have, mm. I have come through looking at what civil society is able to do what civil society is able to add on the development of this country. And mm -hmm. I have gone through to not understand what a terrorist means. I would have called a person who, uh, who comes to Uganda and do illicit financial frauds as a terrorist mm -hmm. than me and Sarah and Robert and the other person who's listening in and working with civil society. And whereby we have not worked with government, we don't know what happens in the government. If we try to go in to understand what happens in government, then it, become, it means you're a terrorist. I want to uh, mm -hmm. bring this uh, through the work that we do with different organizations. And mm -hmm. not only for women rights, uh, uh, NGOs and civil society anyway, it is the same meaning. But I, mm -hmm. have, I have seen um, uh, the citizens going into danger. I have seen the citizens running away from us. I have I've seen the citizens not wanting even to associate with Sarah and Robert and Elliot because, because they, they think talk they about government. Arrested. So meaning mm. you are a terrorist. Mm. I have seen I have seen business people thinking that if you come to tell them it's not good for you to pay taxes twice, it means then you are terrorists. I have seen in the community where we work around the regions where you go and you meet a community development officer and say, mm -hmm. hey, where do you come from? We need to know where are the papers? Mm -hmm. What shows that you work with civil society? What shows that your intention is to change the, 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 the mindset of the community? What shows that you are here to, to, to add on development? So it becomes a very, very big problem. Mm -hmm. I don't think that when we started, we really talked about ourselves. I did not hear Sarah definitely talking about what she has done. I didn't mm -hmm. hear Robert did. saying what we mm -hmm. have done. But from, from, the, from the civil society perspective, mm -hmm. if we have organized to say we want to, uh, to, want to add on government's work, we want to complement on government's work, and we want to add poverty, and then the government comes into Korea terrorists, then it becomes very difficult. And that's where your question becomes harder that, Elliot, what mm. do you think if they call you a terrorist? Mm. We, have, we had break-ins in our office, 
because the time I left, I left the National Association of Women Organizations, I thought mm. that what women want is money. What women want is, uh, is credit. And by the time we started giving credit, our offices were, breaking, were broken in three times. And people come open and they don't take anything. They don't find anything. I want to take us, I want, I want, I want, I want to take you back to when that time came when we were trying to run a campaign of Black Monday campaign on ending poverty. Mm. And then when they came in and found the papers of Black Monday, it was it was hell for me. It was not easy for us to penetrate in Wakiso district because we were branded. We were branded as terrorists. We are branded as people that are fighting government. So it becomes very hard. But taking it back mm. to understanding what we are and why we exist, it is only about those people who came together to understand what they are doing. Because I don't think government has seen a group of people coming together and they register themselves as terrorists. Mm. And going back to the issue of how we went into the issue of shrinking space, I don't think for me, the time they locked in uh, Uganda Women's Network, the mm. time they went in uh, uh, CCG, the time they went into NGO Forum, I don't think I, I had enough sleep. I don't think I saw my people that I work with because I really do a lot of work with different people in different communities. Yes, sir. You can imagine you are in lockdown, there is COVID, and an organization where you are supposed to earn a living, you are supposed to consult with them, it is locked. And there is no explanation. And you can imagine an organization has already organized a meeting in a community. Mm -hmm. They have already mm -hmm. done, uh, done uh, procurements for food, for, 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 room, for hotel rooms and everything. And then the government comes and say, you are locked down. Your accounts are frozen. So it means it does not affect Sarah, Robert and me and maybe you, Romeo. Mm -hmm. But it affects that person that you want to see changing. It affects that person who was supposed to come to the meeting and earn a living and maybe get transport refund of 50,000 and save a 30,000. Mm. It affects that person, that woman, let me talk for, from my own perspective, that woman who is supposed to bring food at the meeting and earn money. It affects this person who is supposed to go and give information and consult and facilitate this meeting. And then it affects that child who is supposed to go to school. Because if I go and do work, I'm paid to pay school fees for my children. Meaning that it is affecting the education system. It mm -hmm. affects that person who is supposed to get to earn that money and go back and pay for health services. Mm -hmm. Meaning that that doctor is not going to get salary because there were no patients. Because you can't take a patient in the, in the, in the health sector of Uganda if you, you don't have money. I don't know, Robert, whether I can go on and go on, but mm. I don't feel I don't feel well. I don't feel Indeed. good if you call me a terrorist. Elliot Orizara is the Executive Director, Women and Girl Child Development Association. Thank you very much for that submission. Let's also talk to Sara Birete, the Executive Director, Center for Constitutional Governance. Sara, is there a role people play to protect CSOs and their operations in Uganda? Well, civil society is part mm. of the large citizenry. Mm. I know that some people look at us as NGOs, you know, the, the, the image that has been created of NGO leaders, mm. big office, big cars, big mm. salary. People don't even know that for most of the time we work as volunteers in our organizations. <laughs> Indeed. When you have an organization, like I run Center for Constitutional Governance. Mm. The day I don't have money, am I expected to close the organization? People no. work for one, two years as volunteers in these spaces mm. because of their passion, because of their beliefs and convictions. Yes. So the, the perception of NGOs and money, and that was part of the blackmail campaign by government. NGOs are foreign agents. So people who at you, you know, like the, the UN office where you see white, then the word UN is in black. So people who at us with those <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> people who at us in those lenses of four wheel drive vehicle, yeah. mm. big money. Mm. And little mm. do I know 
that we fund these NGOs. So I want to break down what it means to run an NGO in Uganda. Please do. Test an NGO as volunteers because there must be people who are held accountable in case something goes wrong mm. in these places. So you have the promoters of an NGO. Once you register an NGO, you have to find an office. You have to find ways of implementing the vision and mission of that, mm. that organization. Yes. So the primary funders of NGOs are the people who found them, who establish them. And for the first three years, no partner can even have a conversation with you because you do not have a minimum track record to discuss with partners. Mm -hmm. So the first funders of NGOs are the founders and they fund them for three years with no single contribution from anybody. After three years, you, you are able to produce audited reports for three years. Mm -hmm. that the minimum requirement for you to have a conversation with a donor. Mm. Active the report for three years, audited reports for three years. Then you can have your conversation with the first donor, which mm. takes you a minimum of one year. Many people think there is a program you can run and tomorrow you have money. You cannot. Yes. So you have first funding for four years is by people who found NGOs and citizens who believe in them because you can have their membership NGOs mm -hmm. where people can pay subscription that helps also to run an organization. So the first founder and owner of an NGO is a citizen. Then you can build partnerships based on your work. If it matches with those partners, that also do similar work and believe in the work you are doing. But when a program st stops, you are not going to close your office because the program has ended. So you get back funding your organization mm -hmm. as a promoter, as a founder, as employees. Some employees have contributed money to run activities in their organizations. Mm -hmm. So it is not all rose and money when it comes to NGO world, like the mm -hmm. general belief by the people. It is not. This situation has been worsened by government saying we get money from donors to promote their, their agenda here. The partners that fund government, I'm sure we are all aware that about 54% of our budget is funded by donors. Indeed. Development budget? No, that is uh, the, the recurrent budget, but also development budget is 100% funded by donors. All yes, programs, mm -hmm. road construction, hospitals, you have seen donors bringing oxygen in our hospitals. These are the same people that work with civil society. The same people taking oxygen in Morago are the same people that work with the Human Rights Center. So mm. when do they become enemies of Uganda? And when are they friends of Uganda? Mm. That is the hypocrisy that citizens of Uganda must understand. It, it seems like they are just afraid of what you might unearth as civil society organizations, not really about the money, not really about whether or not you are terrorists, but what you are unethic as CSO. Seems like they want Ugandans to be in the dark, to be asleep. Well, so. I know during the mm. debate in Changwanzi to open term limits in 2005, mm. when Dr. Matembe was talking about the constitution, I know the president made a remark that she should not open the eyes of the people about the constitution. So maybe there is information and there are people who benefit from ignorance and darkness. Mm. Indeed. But for any society to progress, there must be transparency, there must be openness, there must be access of information, and mm. citizens must be able to question what is wrong. Mm. And that is right. the one civil society does.
All right, thank you very much, Sarah Virete. She was actually so, so vocal on actually explaining what civil society organizations do because of the messaging that is coming in from uh, the government officials who are painting a bad picture on the NGOs and other civil society actors who are actually doing the most when it comes to acquainting the public with the requisite information that they need about the operations of government in that regard. Let me also bring in Robert Mugisa. Robert now is a senior programs uh, officer with that is a human, uh, rights, is a human rights center, Uganda. Uganda. Uh, Robert, let's talk about another very, very pertinent issue right, right here. here. And um, how has the government has hindered the government or continued to hinder operations of CSOs in Uganda? Uh, Romeo, I'm sorry, that sounds like uh, what we began with at the mm. beginning, uh, what we began with earlier, mm. of how the government continues to to hinder the work of civil society organizations we, 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 First of all, we were talking about the background of, of where we have been coming from, what government has been doing to suffocate you as CSOs. Now, fast forward to 2021. What is the political atmosphere looking like? And do you think it is favorable for the CSOs? Isn't it hindering your work? Isn't it hindering your work? Thank you very much. Actually, as, as we sit and discuss on this, uh, platform, mm. uh, I could tell you the truth that uh, civil society is very uncertain of where we are heading uh, with the current regime and the current environment. One is uh, we began this year uh, trying to pick up from 2020. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we've yeah. made our work plans. We, we actually still have our work plans. But uh, the increasing uh, intolerance on the work of civil society Mm. is what really bothers us. Uh, much as uh, we appreciate the hard times uh, posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, yes. which we have really tried to work around because as civil society, since the lockdown was declared, we haven't gone to sleep. We have been thinking and innovating and uh, trying to work around the narrative to ensure mm. that civil society work continues even uh, when we are locked down. So you find that a number of virtual engagements have been going on. We've been receiving reports uh, from people who we work for and uh, our beneficiaries or partners have not ceased to approach us. So the climate is really not good. Uh, you might recall that uh, since DGF, one of the greatest funders of civil society, mm. up to now has never been uh, you know, unsuspended or allowed to work. Uh, in Uganda. So that means that many civil society organizations have their work uh, hindered and we are not able to proceed because you might find that as a sector, there are quite a number of NGOs that are affected. When you look at the number of NGOs in Uganda specifically, there are above 2,000 2, NGOs uh, as uh, figures uh, given by the National NGO Bureau. But uh, of these, like Sarah has been saying, many mm. have gone to sleep because they cannot operate in such a context where every time we are monitored, you know, every time we are surveilled, every time we cannot step out and feel good about our work. Mm. Much as we are non-government, we find that, uh, again, government really interferes with our work. It's like uh, a relationship where... It's a relationship between two parties, but there is a third party who keeps monitoring and looking at what are these guys doing. They can't feel free mm. to, to mm. have their relationship grow. So yes, that Robert. is the kind of context we are operating in. Uh, talk they, about the policy and the legal framework and how it has affected your work. Uganda's policy and legal yes. framework. Yes. Yes. Policy and legal framework. Let me talk quickly about Please. the NGO Act. Please uh, do. There's article, Please uh, section, do. Mm. section 44. Uh, requires that uh, every time we are to conduct activities, we must notify the monitoring committee, we must notify uh, the NGO bureau, we must notify the local government. Mm -hmm. And many times, even as we intend to register our NGOs, many questions are asked, what do you want to do? Then you explain. How are you going to do it? Then you explain. Who is giving you the money? You explain. And many times you find that uh, this becomes unnecessary questioning to our work. Though we accept that regulation should be there, 
it shouldn't be excessive regulation because we know we have a mandate by the time we set up we have objectives and clear focus for our organizations but you find that um, some leaders political leaders uh, vehemently refuse to register or accept uh, particular organizations from operating because of interests that we may not know or because they think that once we begin to operate we shall sabotage uh, the work of government which is really baseless uh, there is a lot uh, of yeah, state Robert, propaganda uh, yeah, yeah, Robert, Robert you're not sabotaging Robert, the work of government you are sabotaging corruption in this yeah exactly but they uh, should know. in terms mm. of they the should know. In terms of the perception that they have towards us, mm. it's a really mm. negative perception. Yet, when you look at what civil society has done, government mm. may never have reached that limit to assist the mm. local uh, person on the ground. So we are on the ground, but because of the tendencies of government, you find that there is censorship uh, mm. of the civil society organizations. The other day I was asking my colleagues, uh, about some of the key issues that we can discuss on some of the platforms. And uh, I received feedback inbox that uh, we better be careful because there's someone who is watching because the laws are used against us. Uh, in a discussion, you know, we have the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, mm -hmm. uh, which allows us to discuss new ideas. Mm -hmm. And some of the new ideas relate to issues that affect us, the laws, the policies, the environment, uh, whatever comes up in the environment, COVID-19, how does it affect the local person so that we can voice and advocate together for better. But you find that um, the laws are used negatively. You might recall that uh, when elections uh, had heated up, the period had heated up, we yes. came up with a, a loose coalition of uh, new you, but you remember the law was used by the NGO Bureau to say that these people are not registered. And there's a recent, uh, there's a recent statement, uh, there's a recent statement that uh, still, uh, still brings that out that uh, we do not allow anyone to operate unless they are registered or unless they are legally formed. But what does it take for us to be legally formed? It's in the hands of a particular group of people who can allow or disallow. So it's a fragile environment. Even when you are registered, they will still find something to shut you down. Yeah, that's what we call um, that's what we call repression against the civil society. They are using mm. what was previously granted mm. to stop it from continuing. If I was mm. uh, registered to monitor elections, they will again use the same mandate that I have to stop mm. me from you know, they'll get whatever excuse to say, don't go to this place because of region, a reason A, B, C, D, you know, reasons A, B, C, D. So the same government that gives us the laws, again, uses them to curtail our work, which is uh, very uh, unwelcome. Very insightful conversation I'm having with Sara Virete, the ED of the Center for Constitutional Governance and also Robert Mugisa. Robert Mugisa is actually the Senior Programs Officer in charge of advocacy at uh, Human Rights Center Uganda. Elia Torizaro is the ED, Women and Girl Child Development Association, with whom I'm very having this very insightful conversation of focusing on the shrinking civic space within Uganda and the role of CSOs. It is, if you will, a public service announcement, which is a message, if you will, in the public interest, disseminated without a charge. That's what we are doing right now with the objective of raising awareness of and changing public attitudes. That's what we want to achieve and behavior towards a social issue. Now, this social issue is civil society organizations. They've been bombed bombarded left, right, and center by government officials. So what we are doing right now is to send this message, uh, trying to detail very, very, very correctly what the right work of CSOs is uh, actually is. Let me bring in the ED, uh, Women and Girls Child uh, Development Association, that is uh, Elliot Orizawa. What would be the immediate impact of Elliot Orizawa when it comes to the shrinking uh, civic space in Uganda on the populace or the political sphere in Uganda? ramifications on the political sphere when it comes to the shrinking civic space. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm. I think, um, as I had said before, we look at different people that we have, we have, we have in our communities mm. and the different people that we have in Uganda.
and uh, mm. we have seen changes in terms of we have the rich and we have those in the middle. And as Robert and Sarah said, civil society is not just created. It is organized because there is an issue. But if a certain individual feels that civil society is, is something that just comes in space, mm -hmm. just to do nothing, then it means it affects different people. As Robert says, when you hear of new rook, new rook may be coming in as another, another organization, yes. as another civil society, as another mm. think tank, as another development partner. But if you still have that space where people feel you are not fit to be in, then it becomes a problem. If you, if you go back to uh, understanding what civil society mean to us, Majority of civil society, by the time you start, there is a vision bearer. And these civil society organizations have vision. They have values. They stand to do different things altogether, but they don't stand to do these things for, for animals or to do it for water. It is to do it for people that live in the country. And if, if you just go back to where Uganda started and where we are now, just yes. in 1962, if you say that we are an independent country, then it means people are supposed to be independent. If an organization comes out to say, I want really to stand with people who want to change the mindset of their people to go out of poverty. I want people to understand, as Sarah says before, that majority of civil studies stand out to say, we want to demand for accountability. We want to stand out and say, we want to ensure there is transparency. And then you say, no, if you are talking about transparency, if you are talking about accountability, then you see it's not to be working. Then you need to go back and change your constitution. You need to go back and change your values. You need to go back and change your vision. It becomes very difficult. The shrinking space does not only affect the individuals like Romeo and Sarah. It affects the child who is unborn, it affects the child who is born, it affects the child who is going to school, it affects the child who is going to get married, it affects that mother who is going to breastfeed. Because if I'm talking about, about uh, accountability for the money that has gone to Murago, for the money that has gone to that uh, uh, health center three, and then you say, no, please don't talk about it. My mother may not know how much money Uganda is going to use in this COVID, in this mm. pandemic, or even in the lockdown, or how much money do the teachers need in schools? But if she paid fees for me, or if mm. he paid fees for me, and he wants me to come yes, back sir. and organize, it doesn't mean that I'm mm. fighting government. It doesn't mean that I'm fighting mm. government. It becomes hard for us. I can give you one example of a civil society where I belong, civil society budget advocacy group. Mm. The time we were running a campaign of, uh, of taxing MPs, it was mm. hard. We became terrorists. Mm. If I take you back to Sarah, when Sarah started talking about people are going to steal votes, mm. people started calling me, Elliot, you know Sarah, she's a woman like you, but let her keep quiet. Anytime she's going to be zipped up, you know, when I talk of zipped up, you know what I mean down. Indeed, indeed. Her down completely, mm. You know, <laughs> then it becomes yes. hard. Mm. I have had space where I have engaged with uh, a, global, uh, a global network mm. and where we are talking about shrinking space and other mm. people would come and ask, how has Uganda managed to make you shut up? Where are your MPs? The biggest problem that we have as civil society, if an MP, an individual leaves civil society, let's say today I leave women and girl children and I go mm. to... To the, to the to parliament, then mm. I cease to be that citizen. I become a different person. I feel mm. like I don't live in that village where there is no water, where there is no uh, 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 a nurse in the, in the labor wood. I mm. cease to be that person who moves in that road where there are pit holes. Mm. I cease to be that person who goes 
Yes, Elliot. We seem to be losing uh -huh. Elliot Orizawa. She is the ED of Women in Girl yes, Child at the Government Association. You know, Go ahead. I become a different mm. person and I want to make mm. sure that I'm government. And then the other one is civil society, is the listeners. Is that civil society? If you asked me, Robert and Sarah, mm -hmm. yes, if I asked the Yes, Elliot. Oh, sorry. Like Sarah mentioned before, and in relation to the shooting space, you have me. It becomes very different. Is in a, I, there's an if the other person says, no, your vision is wrong. Then another person comes to say, no, there are issues concerning human rights and women's rights. And the, the same person in Uganda mm. comes to tell you, know, what you are talking about is wrong. So we should not talk about it. I just want to mm. conclude on the shrinking space and the impact on unemployment. Just in case you know where we came from when these offices were closed, there are people who lost their jobs. There are people who left and they even feared coming back to these offices. How do I come to an organization mm. which the government has closed? So it uh, is not about. Elliot, you also have members of the public who are benefiting from the work you are doing and the money that was yes. frozen. Yes. I want to talk about journalists and mm. mainly and mainly the radio people who, who came to say, you people come out and talk and we're asking them, why mm. don't you talk? You know, yes. so it yes. becomes very difficult. If you look at mm. the levels of unemployment, if you, if you compare the number of the university boys and girls that graduate every mm. year and they come to say, I have come to volunteer. Romeo, sometimes mm. I have more years at office. No, mm -hmm. and this is someone mm -hmm. who has a second a second upper degree who is supposed to work wow. in government but government has no space and this mm -hmm. person can't go to sarah sarah has no space can't mm -hmm. go to robert robert has no space then mm -hmm. the person wants to do internship the person wants to volunteer for six year, six months and this person has nowhere to go by the time you want to go to ccg it is closed Indeed. You know? So the impact, the impact is too huge. Mm. The impact is given to that person who is a support staff at a mm. certain school. You know, if Indeed. civil society is closed, just know that this person is now going to feed more than three, five people at our household at lunch time because mm. these uh, the, the workers are not are not at the at the job because they are closed. Elliot Orizarwa is the ED Women and Girl Child Development Association. Let's also bring in Sara Birete, the ED for the Center for Constitutional Governance. Sara Birete. So, um, the impact is still huge. I want, hmm. I want to take it at different things. Yeah, Sara Birete, at, at the tail end of 2020, the Democratic uh, Governance Facility, that is DGF, it resolved to actually disperse some 100,000 Uganda shillings to some of the vulnerable families within Kampala. Now, guess what the government said? The government said the money would make Ugandans lazy. Now, I was one of the people who were surprised when the same Prime Minister, Nabanja, the same government that shot down the same idea, was talking about giving out 100,000 to Ugandans. And I was like, okay. So why did we stop the DGF? Was it because all the political clout and uh, the praises would go to DGF and not the government? Pa Jocelyn, Sarah. We, yes, we have, a, I think we have lost our value system as a country mm. and, and mainly through leadership. Mm. So leadership looks at patronage and, and uh, keeping power. Mm. As the ultimate, and the, as as a result, we have lost our value system. But Ubuntu is part of the African value system. Indeed. In Ubuntu system, you cannot watch as your neighbor suffers. Indeed. So during lockdown, there were families that could not survive because of the nature of their earnings, the nature mm. of their work. If the head of a family or the breadwinner is a street vendor and citizens are under lockdown, what happens to that family? 
Indeed. If the head of a family is a taxi driver and public transport is banned, so that is the spirit through with that, that organization with USID was giving money to vulnerable families that could not survive lockdown and had no means of survival, alternative means of survival. Mm -hmm. But the government, because by then when in politics, the first phase of COVID was administered politically. Government wanted to harvest as much political capital as they could, but also freeze out all other entities from suspected harvesting of political capital. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's why that organization was stopped from giving money. Mm -hmm. But even in the second lockdown, when the prime minister said she would give out money, the same policy they refused. They failed. I, up to that, I've just seen in the news that they are still discussing after easing of lockdown on how to give money to about 30,000 families. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, mean, I, I wanted to twist that into a perspective whereby we talk about the double standards coming in from government. When they say it is not good, and then later on they adopt it. You understand the fact that the idea came from DGF, they shut it down. Now, later on, they adopted the same idea. It seems like government just was afraid that DGF would get more political clout and make government look bad, that you're not doing anything and we are the ones actually trying to help people. Is that the I, biggest problem with I, government and NGOs? I agree, Romeo, and it's the same perspective hmm. that makes NGOs enemies of Uganda. Hmm. NGOs work with the most vulnerable and poor communities of society. Mm, mm. I will use an example of Ursanja evictions, mass evictions, where about 100 families were evicted. Yes, but we had the public lawyers and NGOs coming in to help money, mm. to help the people that had, sorry, to help the people that had been evicted. So government looks at NGO work as a competition for legitimacy with the people. Yet it has no plan or capacity to salvage or help the suffering communities. So when people are given shelter by government, by NGOs, <coughs> then you have become a, an alternative center of power. They do not look at the plight of the people. They look at NGOs as alternative center of power, provide for the people. Mm. But the suffering of the people does not concern them. And that's why we are enemies of government. There is no crime NGOs are doing. Sure. And that's why we are deemed enemies. All right. Also, Sarah Bireta, from the perspective of the Center for Constitutional Governments, would also like to hear your two cents on how the shrinking a civic space is actually affecting the whole political sphere in Uganda. What happened to shrink that civic space? Also give us your two cents on that. Yes, building on what my co-panelists have shared, we mm. have a vision. Mm. Contradict fundamental Yes, sir. Yes, is my internet on? So we have a right of laws, <laughs> yes, contradicting the constitution, freedoms enshrined in the constitution. Mm -hmm. And just on an analysis of Article 29, we have mm -hmm. established 17 laws that contradict Article 29 of the constitution on freedom mm -hmm. of association, assembly, expression, and conscience. I mm -hmm. think it's important to note that largely out of Article 29, it is only a freedom of worship that is enjoyed in this country. The other freedoms are constrained by the acts of the state, either through laws or actions. Beyond that, we have other laws that, are, that contradict internationally agreed norms and standards of democracy. So that's yes, what leaves the space on the policy aspect. Mm. But beyond that, we have actions like the police and the army. For them, mm. is an example of just concluded elections. Mm. Elections are about citizens' participation, free participation of the people to choose their leaders. And their leaders should have won in a free, fair, you know, regular <laughs> and, and, and a quantifiable election. 
But up to today, I don't think any Ugandan can be a hundred percent sure that the outcome of the elections was the will of the people. Or that the elections that the Electoral Commission read is what the people voted because of the manner of, of the exercise. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the violence and, and militarism around the free citizens exercises like an election. This yes, is what is shrinking the space. The acts of duty bearers, people paid by a taxpayer to protect and guarantee their, their, their rights and the way they violate these results mm. in favor of an individual. Yes. Let me also bring in Robert Mugisa. Robert Mugisa is the senior programs officer at uh, Human Rights Center Uganda. Let's also use the human rights perspective, Robert Mugisa. The shrinking uh, civic space, can it lead to more human rights violations taking center stake? Simply because the big brother, the CSOs, the NGOs are being cut off from doing their work. So the shrinking civic space will it lead to more human rights violations within our country. Robert? Robert Mugisa, can you hear me? Thank you, Romeo. And uh, I'll begin from where Sarah has stopped. All right. Uh, to say that um, it's obvious. Hmm. Can you hear me? I do, I do. Go ahead. Can you hear me little, now? A little bit of a freeze, but go ahead. Yes, Robert. Can you get me now? Yes, I yes. do. I'm saying I'm saying that I'll begin from where Sarah stopped mm. uh, to say that uh, it's obvious that uh, the shrinking space, uh, the shrinking of the work of civil society leads mm. to violation and abuse of so many people's rights. Because one, uh, we fight for democratic principles. Mm. We fight for citizenship uh, to enjoy their rights. We fight for transparency and accountability. We are more of uh, the feet that bring good news uh, to the community. Meaning that if you shrink the person who is delivering food, the person who is delivering information to the public, it means that they are then cut off. They cannot access everything that they want uh, to live right. So beginning from the laws themselves, the constitution has an entire chapter four, which talks about human rights and fundamental freedoms. And uh, those are very basic rights that are brought down from um, the UN, uh, the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, mm. which means that we are promoters of human rights, social, cultural rights are promoted entirely and uh, largely by the civil society. And when we talk about civil society, we are talking about an organized group of people who are really reaching out for the heart of the people. They are, yeah. it's, a, it's a community of organized individuals and organizations that yeah. whose heart beats for the common person uh, on the, uh, at the grassroots. So the continuous curtailing of the work or shrinking of the space within which civil society operates mm -hmm. largely contributes to the violation and the abuse of human rights. For example, if a human rights defender, if a civil society actor like Sarah, or, or let's say uh, my colleague Orizawa, or anyone else, or Romeo. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. stopped from doing your work, it, it means that there's a line of people who have their rights, but because you're now curtailed, it means those people can no longer enjoy what they have been enjoying. When we talk about, for example, baby homes and orphanages, when we yes, talk Robert. where human rights defenders and civil society promoted, it means that when you shrink the space of these civil society actors, everyone else then uh, is shrunk. Everyone else cannot enjoy their work. And therefore our role uh, is very important in as far as ensuring that on a daily basis, we speak, we watch, we document and report about some of these issues so that 
the accountable people, the duty bearers, are able to act and uh, make sure that everyone in society enjoys their naturally granted rights and fundamental freedoms. So to answer your question, the shrinking of human rights defenders, the shrinking of civil society organizations work leads to the equal shrinking of the enjoyment of rights by the citizenry. Hmm. Elio Torizarwa, would you like to actually add on to that submission from Robert Mugisa on the shrinking civic space? Yeah, uh, when, when, when uh, Robert was saying, my mind was just, was just moving and mm -hmm. uh, moving to different spaces. I think uh, if we talk of the three levels, the macro level, the meso level, and the micro level. Mm. At an individual level where we talk of the micro, we have already said that really the shrinking space affects us differently. Even you, Romeo, you said even you who work with us, you are affected. Mm. Mm. But when you go at a household level, it becomes hard. It becomes hard because these individuals come to make that space. And if government shrinks space for, for society, then it means it has really shrunk the, same, the whole space. And mm. people can't think beyond. People start fearing you. I had, I had talked about the issue of fear of people when they see us. For example, us, we are, we are, we are trying to um, sensitize the market dwellers, mainly the women in the market, on the role of civil society. Mm. But you can't imagine what we are, what we are finding in these markets. Mm. People think that civil society is fighting government. People think that civil society, you are not supposed to speak when there is no government letter. Mm. Do you have an official letter from government? Are we supposed to give you information? You know, and it becomes hard. Oh, we had they they stopped you from working. You know, if they had only one information from organization being closed, then it means all of you are not supposed to work. So it becomes hard. When you look at the macro level, you just need to know if DGF can be just locked up, can it just decide and say no, no more giving money out, then it means they also fear to come here. And maybe it, it may go back, it may go beyond to international monetary fund if your government is not ready to work with you, then how do we come to work with you? It becomes mm. hard. Talk if about we, the plight of our CSOs in politics, Elliot Orizawa. It seems like the most know. affected CSOs and NGOs are operating in politics, issues to do with governance and uh, not, so forth. Not really, what, mm. not really, not really. Even organizations that were giving, uh, were giving relief, like mm. giving food during COVID, they were stopped. Organizations, if you are working a women's organization, they feel you are working with that group. They feel you are not supposed even to mention. You know, as long as you make they them want look to bad. Ask you, yes, where do you get that money? Who gives mm. you that money? Is that money for LGBT? Is it money that is supposed to be in Uganda? It becomes hard. Why are you working with women? Which type of women are you working with? It becomes mm. hard. You know, the viewers, so who, are, you know, really the viewers who are watching this session would like to know how best as CSOs can we push back against this shrinking civic space? Uh, I, I think how, what we are supposed to do and uh, to the listeners, yes. first of all, we have agreed as CSOs that we need to go back and revisit our vision. And revisiting a vision means you want to see beyond what you have, not, what you have been seeing today. We want to go back like what we are doing now, not only sensitize people through Zoom, through YouTube, through Facebook, but to go to the local level and really explain what it means. You know, if Sarah said that by the time she started, she spent three years, Sarah may have spent 10 years putting money in my organization. I need to change that vision <laughs> and, and everything. And people still believe you are their light in that community, mm -hmm. you know? You can't imagine how yes. many people knock on my gate asking for food. Where is food? You mean government is bringing food? They know the name of Nabanja is a big name, but they feel I'm the Nabanja at that community level. So Indeed. we need to go back and rethink. Romeo, we have different organizations in Uganda. We have so, so if government staff. is to frustrate you, if, if government is to frustrate your efforts within that area, those people wouldn't yes. be helped. Yes. Mm. 
They will not. Definitely, they will not. But what mm. I want to bring to the to the listeners mm. is about what we want to see. You know, we want to see other people to come and work together. We want to we want the people to know that a civil society is grouped into different in, into different spaces. They are civil society. Romeo, are you still with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, Elliot. Okay, so what I'm saying, uh, the, the listeners and the viewers should really know that civil society is in different ways. There are civil societies that are working on political issues. There are civil society organizations that are working on social issues. There are those that are working on economic issues. There are civil mm. society that they are working on environmental issues. There are civil society that are working on, on issues of human rights. But what is very important for us to know is we are not different from people who are in parliament. The people in parliament are working on their policies. But again, we must really go into to understand what these policies are for. Because these policies are not for the people who are in parliament. They are not for ministers. It, these policies are for Ugandans. And therefore, if civil society organizations, let's say, are working on political issues, they are only trying to sensitize, to build the capacity of the citizens to understand exactly what they are supposed to, what they are supposed to do in terms of engaging the policymakers. But again, if you come to say, don't talk about the debt that the government has, don't talk about the uh, don't talk ad, about the increased uh, gender-based violence during COVID. Don't talk about the teenage pregnancy and who pregnanted these girls. Don't give out pads. Don't give out food. Then it becomes hard for us. Mm. All right, I that think, is. Mm, go yes, ahead, Elliot. Go I, ahead. I just wanted. I just wanted to talk about uh, about the relationship. Go ahead. How do we work on relationship? Of recent, mm. we are discussing how far Uganda has gone in terms of implementing the 17 SDGs. Mm -hmm. And for sure, for me, I have not had government inviting me to attend a meeting where they are discussing the SDGs. But again, the government wants to come to us and say, hey, Sarah, where is your report? What have you done on SDGs? Robert, as a human rights uh, defender, where is, where is your report? But again, how do we start if we are shrinked, if we are just there, not even talking about it? How do I go to yes. government to ask where is your report? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it becomes hard. So yes. for me, I think we need to go back. If they are saying you need to have these legal procedures, let yes. us also go back and ask government, how do we work together to develop this country? We don't mm -hmm. want to continue seeing the differences. We don't want to continue <laughs> seeing the increased inequalities. We don't want to, to continue seeing the increase in the deaths for Uganda. And we don't want to see people fighting for COVID-19, mm. people fighting for the vaccine. For me, I haven't had the vaccine because mm. I feel I really don't have the information. If we come out to say, people here, this is the information. If mm. you are vaccinated, this happens. They will ask you, are you, are you a doctor? Mm. But all the doctors will not come to where I work. Indeed. Thank you so much, Romy. The, the good thing, Elliot, you mentioned something about COVID-19. We shall talk about how the pandemic has affected your work. I know government is suffocating you. Even the pandemic itself is suffocating your operations. We shall get back to that And after our other panelists actually exhaust their views on this very, very pertinent question on how they are pushing back against the shrinking civic space. Sada Videte is the ED Executive Director Center for Constitutional Government. We'd like to hear your perception when it comes to how best we can push back against this shrinking a civic space as a center for constitutional governance? What ought to be done? I, I think what we need to do as a sector, first of all, the protecting civil society should not be the work of me, Robert Elliott, and other colleagues in civil society. Indeed. It should be the work of all citizens because the beneficiaries of our work, we, we are not the beneficiaries of our work. I can defend my rights. I'm a lawyer. Mm. But the rights of other people that we protect are the ones that will suffer when we cease to protect them. Yes, sir. So it, is, it should be the, our beneficiaries to protect the space that is shrunk by government. Mm. Unfortunately, there is an information gap on what they need to do and what they can do. But also the government has created a lot of fear in the public because of violence. 
So people think that to speak up, you will be undressed. You will... I remember the first days my children would tell me, mommy, we don't want to see you being thrown on a pickup. <laughs> we don't want to see you being undressed in public. Please, mommy, stay at home. So mm. we have this fear that goes beyond our children and our family. Mm. So nobody... The psychological distress. Yes, nobody wants mm. to see their relatives, you know, being mishandled by police. Mm. Nobody Maybe. wants to be a victim of, of violence. Mm. So this, this shrinks our space further. Even at household level, you have your children can cry. When we are leaving for a press conference and they get to know they hear you making calls, mommy police is going to arrest you. Now we are not going to watch TV, you will be there beaten. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And, I, I, and I don't know how many people go through this. Mm, so many. it affects our work. And, mm. and my call is to government, really. Our, our partnership, again, Romeo, we work with the government. Many people think we mm. are against the government. Mm. But there is a misunderstanding on government and the party in power. Government means executive, parliament, judiciary. We work with government, but we are not spokespersons of NRM. Mm. And that's where the misunderstanding comes. Even the duty bearers, people in office, do not understand the difference between the government and the ruling party. So they think if we were speaking about the policy of NRM, NRM as a party, you are against the government, which government? So this is, I think, I don't, and I don't know what has gone wrong. So we are not mm. spokespersons of NRM, but we work with government. We work mm. with all government agencies, Law Reform Commission, Electoral Commission, Parliament. We are always in courts where we take our cases. So we work with government and we are not against the government, but we challenge wrong policies that we think are not pro people. Mm. The same applies to general political parties. People think we are pro-opposition. No. We, do, we are not pro any political party, but at times we have convergence on areas of advocacy. You are pro people's issues. Yes. So if you are talking about mismanagement of COVID and the leader of opposition mm. is talking about mismanagement of COVID, mm. that does not make me a, 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 a spokesperson of noob. But we have an area that is concerning the people that we can jointly work on. That mm. is part of the misunderstanding that, mm. that, that is causing also blackmail. So what we need is for government to understand mm. that there can never be a government unless you have three things. Mm. One is the territorial integrity, the geographical space. Two is the people. Three is the economy, and maybe we can add four as the rules. Mm. If you have a nation defined by four things, and then for you, you are working against to those four things, so is the enemy of Uganda. Mm. So we need to challenge these practices that are taking away our space as citizens of Uganda, not just as NGOs. Well, the citizens would like to challenge these issues, Sarah Pireta, like you mentioned before, they do not have the information on what they need to do or how to do it. So maybe you should break it down for the citizens who are listening and watching this session right now, what they ought to be doing practically. I think we need to, of course, they, some of them don't have the information, but what we need is, even in our small spaces, let me use an example of household level. We need to nurture a democratic culture that, if, that allows even our children to question some of the things that we do that are wrong. Mm. So once you suffocate children, I don't know remember whether you have children. Once no, I don't. Have, do you have? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> oh my goodness. Because if the parent is being roughed up, there is no yes. way the child might speak up because they are afraid already. They saw yeah. mother, Sarah Pireta, being beaten up. So how can the child themselves actually speak up? No, there mm. is dictatorship at family level that kills mm. our culture generally. Mm. So when you raise children that you cannot allow them to question anything, even as mm. adult citizens, they will mm. fail to question the wrongs by their leaders because the leadership acts at that smaller level. 
So we need to nurture freedoms, not to the excessive level, I know people are saying, but we need to nurture freedoms and ability to question yes. wrongs. Even at household level, we should allow challenge at household level. Mm. We should allow challenge at places of work. Some of us, of course, being a, a head of an organization might not be easy. At times, we are also dictators in our small space. But people should push back and question our decisions. Then from there, we run out question the duty bearers. If somebody is coming to evict people in the night, I know that many people might not be aware that you cannot evict people beyond 6 p.m. in the evening. But my even during the pandemic. Yes, even without a pandemic. Hmm. With, even without a pandemic. But majority hmm. evictions and by police are done in the night. So if you happen to wake up, you should question that police office and say, why are you doing this in the night? Why don't you come back tomorrow? Why don't you come back with the ROC? These are simple things that we can do. And in the long run, these small actions will result into bigger democratic dividends for all of us. So even members of security are in collusion with these criminals, Sarah Pirete, to actually wreak havoc on our citizens, meaning that's simply why they do not want this work of accountability or oversight being uh, orchestrated by the NGOs, because the criminals are within security and government. Precisely. When we do our work, we step on so many toes. Mm. So many toes of people doing wrong things and exploiting their citizens. Mm. Yeah, that's why NGOs are not popular. You are hated. When you are an NGO person, you are not popular with those who have power because you are stepping on their toes and stopping their exploitation of the people. Now, Sarah, if the criminals themselves are hiding within government and many of these uh, security uh, departments, what is the future of CSOs in Uganda? It seems like uh, it is non-existent. They just want to wipe you out. You, nobody has ever managed to wipe out society. Even when Hitler tried, mm. people still survived him. Indeed. Civil society is part of society. Nobody will wipe it out, mm. whether they try it or not. We mm. are citizens, we are in our spaces. The work we do are actions of, small, of people in their small capacities, but they change the course of events mm. in humanity, in the rest of humanity. And we and shall I'm not do that. And of course, right now, Sarah Bideta, we are changing the course of events and the narrative that, is, that was being pushed before by the government. So negative, uh, painting CSOs in a very, very bad light. But now that we are pushing on with this conversation, government officials are watching and they are actually are demand to actually rectify that situation right there. CSOs want to work with government to expedite uh, change or development within this country. Uh, Robert, you disappeared. Please come back. Robert, Robert, Robert Avori. All right, Elliot Orizawa, let's just engage you as we wait for uh, Robert Orizawa to get back on that what? issue. Yeah. Mm. What, will it, what will it take to change the image of CSOs in Uganda? Besides what we are I talking think about the time right is now. now. Mm. Yeah, the time is now that things have changed. All of a sudden, when we talk of the uh, office breaking, the shrinking space, but mm. the time is now when we have started again rebuilding mm. and resharpening the space in a way that if we can agree that sensitizing the masses, because maybe before some of the organizations started before when we were born, and maybe every time we see uh, youth growing up, not to understanding exactly what is happening. Because if you hear some of the youth talking, they feel civil society is a space to go and get money. Some of them feel that money is just on the table, you find it. By the time you get there, they then tell you, oh, your organization is closed. Maybe by the time you have earned your first salary. So I think the most important thing for me is to, is, uh, to sensitize people. And I want to agree with government that uh, today they are talking about mindset change mm. in the communities and I think that is what uh, the civil society that work in Uganda should really, really go back to, changing mm. the mindset of those who have just joined uh, parliament.
for those who have just uh, joined the space to understand the difference between civil society mm. and government work. And then I think uh, building the relationship is a very big thing that for me, Indeed. I think uh, building the relationship between civil society, mm -hmm. the development partners. Can we talk about the beneficiaries, of the, the women and the girl child? How have they been affected by this shrinking civic space? There's something we haven't touched on, and I really believe it's really important. The beneficiaries, the women especially, and the girl child. How have they been of this continuing of shrinking all, civic space? First of all, I want to start talking about, I want to start with the increased numbers of teenage of teenage pregnancy. And my question, my question I have, I have put my question on my Twitter, and I was asking people who is pregnanting this girl? If we are talking about the teenage pregnancies, who is pregnanting this girl? And I have heard people saying, you have not really empowered boys. But again, the question is, how do we empower boys? Do you want us to empower boys and men to pregnant the girls? That is the biggest question. And during this lockdown, we have observed and we have found out from different households, the high levels of violence against children, high levels of violence against women. And this, and going back to the shrinking space, we have had those cases and challenges, but we have not seen government saying that civil society that is working towards the women's rights and girls' rights should come together and maybe government is going to give, to give a guideline. And if I can give you one, uh, one, of, the, one of the organizations that bring us together as women organizations, the Uganda Women's Network is one of the organizations that was closed during, uh, during the, the, the last lockdown. The, their accounts were freezed. And I had said before that the majority of women really were affected. Well, during, this, yeah, during this lockdown, the girls and women have also been affected by the shrinking space in a way the government has not allowed us to give to give people money i mean to give people food i can give you uh, uh, can give the, the the listeners one thing that really um, took me back why should the government think of giving the 100000 to people living in the municipality if you know people living in the municipality we have had border border guys saying madam we did not get money, but that gentleman who has a house, who has a house in the city, who has mm. two cars, received the 100,000. And if you came to where we work, mainly here in Wakiso, I don't think we have more than 10% of women that received the 100,000. The 100, Remember, you. the women that we work with are the women that work in the market. In the three markets, first of all, that I mentioned, that we are, uh, that we are piloting this project, mm. in Wakisa here in Uganda, where we, where we work, mm. out, of, out, of ten, out of ten dwellers, there are eight women, and they were not allowed to go back home. Mm. And imagine the majority of these girls are single mothers. Their girls were leaving home. They are not at school, meaning some of them may be the ones pregnant. Mm. So the, 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 the impact, the impact is, is revolving in a way. Mm. If you, you go to schools, we work with uh, female, female educators mm. and the support staff. The majority of the schools, you find that the people who uh, wash plates for, the, for our pitos, the people who sweep mm. are women. They, don't, they have not received the 100,000. The schools are still locked down. And remember, mm. the majority are working in private schools. So meaning Indeed. that they don't have salaries and they don't have where to go. They were not counted as vulnerable persons in Uganda. Mm. We have women who are living with HIV AIDS and women who are living, uh, who, are disab who have disabilities. You have a disability, you are living with HIV AIDS, you have a child who is not at school and you are just there. And the government has not said civil society organization in this community, please go and map out these people and maybe tell mm. us what we can do. Mm. We're not given that, mm. that chance. 
We are not given that chance that you go and map out these people. Tell us who are the vulnerable. I did not hear government say that. Mm -hmm. They just made a decision that vulnerable people are those people living in the municipality, but we have growth centers, you know? Mm -hmm. We still think we have not we have not remembered to go back to think of what Robert Chambers says. Mm -hmm. If a po if, if you have a poverty, if you have poverty levels, how do we define poverty? How do you define uh, yes. vulnerability? And you forget mm -hmm. that there are people who are living in the villages where mm -hmm. their children were living in Kampala, but at the time when they said lockdown, yeah, they went back. Remember, mm -hmm. these parents had already sold land to buy motorcycles for these children to come here. And then mm. you say, okay, we have locked down and the 100,000 is going to vulnerable people who are living in the municipal councils. There are so many things I can bring out. But again, mm. I think what again has uh, uh, the, the most uh, important thing that we may need to share is the number of That's shelters, the, the number of shelters that we have, mm. the safe spaces for the girls. Yes. You can imagine we are all talking up on Zoom. We are reaching few, few families. But we have not yes. had Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development coming out and say, we have money for those old persons. I don't think during these lockdowns, the government really gave that money, you know? They were still giving them the 25,000 every month that I, they were supposed to receive. Actually, but the recommendation was for the elderly to receive 100,000. Actually, they mm. no longer even give a month. They wait for some time. So in those three months, some <laughs> old people have died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the psychological issues, the Indeed. psychological issues, you know. Mm. You are, to this hour. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, you very much. She is the, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. She is the AD for a, a Women and Girl Child Development Association. Thank you very much. Um, Robert Mugisa Abwali, you disappeared for a while there, sir. You haven't spoken. You have two good questions. Um, oh, we yes, did sir. talk about um, insights or perspectives coming in now from your side, which is the Human Rights Center, Uganda. What perspectives? Perspectives do you have or two cents to share with us when it comes to pushing back against the shrinking civic space? What are the recommendations coming in from the Human Rights Center, Uganda? And you can also talk about the shrinking space of CSOs and how it has affected the women and the girls. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the CSOs, uh, civil society organization, are not being considered essential workers during this COVID-19 pandemic meaning you are not actually um, in a good state or greater state to actually move about and help women and girls who are grappling with gender-based violence and so many other issues that have taken center stage during this pandemic. But go back to the first question. How best can we push back against this shrinking space? Robert. Thank you, Romeo, and uh, I hope you can hear me very well. I do. Okay, okay. Uh, I want to appreciate the... Uh, our viewers and listeners, uh, probably we shall have some time to respond to the questions in we the should. chat room. Mm. Yeah, but then uh, going to the question of um, the pushing back, pushing back uh, against what is happening to us. One, I think for us, it's important to engage more in dialogue uh, mm. with the powers that be, because uh, many times I find we are speaking to ourselves uh, but then there is uh, a need for us to step out. I know we have a lot of influence. That is I why sometimes we are feared. Mm. Uh, mm. We, we, we are talk to not to the victims per se, but also to the state actors who are limiting our space. Uh, they really need to hear this. Recently, we have been working on the Universal Periodic Review reports, and mm. we have uh, engaged the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, from from the discussions, you feel like they are with you. But uh, when you get to the level where you seek real answers, then uh, that's when the problems come. They feel like we are pushing too much. And for us, we think now the way we can push back the pressure from the state and all this uh, clamping down of our space is to regularly engage them. If they are saying we should uh, involve them in our activities, then we are going to engage more uh, with them so that they can understand our narrative. They can understand what mm. we are really seeking. It's not for bad, Indeed. but it's for the good of our country. And the of other course, thing you're not I'm tourists. Looking... And since you, uh, no. you know, uh, all is near the citizens of this country, my dear Robert, I'm telling you, it's because you understand them very well. You understand yeah. the challenges that they grapple with on a daily basis and so mm. forth. You should be helped by the government uh, in that regard to help you, you know, do or reach out to more vulnerable people in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want the government to really understand mm. our position 
We want them to mm-hmm. come close to us, not to run away from us mm-hmm. or to push us away uh, from yes, right. uh, our work. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing I'm talking about is what my colleagues have said, uh, Sarah and uh, and Elliot, about Expand sensitization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ex- sensitization of the masses. Uh, Romeo, the truth is we have done sensitization. We but uh, we are challenged by the fact that our work as civil society actors is so wide uh, that sometimes we are limited uh, from reaching everybody on the ground, the common person mm-hmm. on the ground. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, as much as possible, even after this uh, meeting, we have a recording that we think we should share widely uh, for we people should. to understand our cause, to understand mm. that we need to change the narrative mm. from looking at us, civil society, as enemies that bring us close as friends. Let me yes, quickly Robert. move on to the issue of women and girls. The uh, fact really that CSOs, the effort of women. The fact that CSOs Pardon? are not being considered essential workers. The fact that CSO civil society organizations oh. were not being considered essential workers within yeah. this uh, lockdown or pandemic. Do you envisage or okay. expect uh, that is the reason why we saw so many uh, teenage pregnancies, um, young girls being married, or simply because you couldn't do your work to disseminate this information in a verified manner, whereby it targets the vulnerable people or the victims, which are the girls? There's one element of our work. Mm. There's one element of us as civil society organizations being watchdogs. Mm. Uh, and as watchdogs, we are looking at what is happening in our environment and trying to provide solutions. Because people are looking for real solutions, not possible solutions. <clears throat> and therefore, when you see what is happening in our society, it may not be the fact that civil society has not been doing enough. But we could also tag that to the issue of moral decay and, and mm. values, mm. values in our society. Uh, uh, my, my, my elder Sarah and uh, my colleague Elliot have talked about families, the family as the unit. When you mm. get into these families, much as we are civil society actors, actors, we cannot be in every home, we cannot be in every community, but about talking, we can only talk about the morals that uh, we should have as people, uh, because we, we want to encourage everybody to know that you may not have to belong to civil society to be able to do the right thing. Instead, we are telling you that wherever you are, do the right thing. So teenage pregnancies is not about civil society's absence. No, mm. we are present, but uh, I think it goes back to who, like, like Elliot has said, who mm. is this that is impregnating the young girls? Mm. It is the men, it is the boys in the society. Mm. Why are they doing that? We need to question in that area and then be able to speak and also to provide real solutions to the issue at hand. What is okay. the root cause of, of, of these people going to sleep with the girls, mm. which we condemn, mm. which we really uh, speak against, Okay. And therefore, our effort as civil society is to publicize information mm. that uh, it is important to protect the girl child. It is important to respect the women. Uh, and, and we don't want to have a narrative of pushing more for mm. women's rights Indeed. and for getting inside and the duties that we have as men. Because I, I can speak on behalf of men that we too need sensitization. We do, the girls we do. need to be sensitive. The girls mm. need to be sensitized. The work of civil society mm. has to reach to the girl child, to the woman, to the person with disability, but also to the man who is actually causing more of these problems mm. to the young girls. So once we change that mindset that these are girls, these are sisters, these are mothers of tomorrow, then we think more men can come to the realization that they should partner with civil society organizations mm. to promote the rights of girls and women. So it's not the pandemic per se. Mm. I will not blame it so much onto the pandemic because uh, these pregnancies have been there even before COVID, but they have just escalated even that now people are staying together in homes, which shouldn't be again a problem, mm. but it's just the morals, the, 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 the perspectives mm. with which these people look mm. at the girls as objects, as, uh, you know, sex objects. Yes, right, yes. And that has really caused a big problem. 
Robert Mugisa, uh, 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 there is one of our attendees or participants who is actually concurring with you. She's saying that she's Carol Bankusha. She says locking up the doors of an organization is as much as a lockdown of a particular country, ultimately affecting the socioeconomic trend of a country and its inhabitants. How true is this statement? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Romeo, hmm. I have been... Uh, following closely, and, and on, on the 30th of July, when uh, the president spoke to the nation and spoke to mm. us about lifting the lockdown, there's a, there's a part where it is clear that uh, seminars and workshops remain banned, except mm. with the explicit permission from the Minister of Health and related MDS. That is a ban. That is more of civil society, guys. Just mm. stay where you are. Because we, we work more, like Elliot has said and Sarah, we go down to the communities, much as the transport has been open. We work more with people, we work more with meetings, we work more with seminars, we work more with uh, dialogues and community engagement. So when you, when you ban uh, seminars and workshops, it's more like saying civil society work, please hold on. It's like saying faith-based organizations, hold on, we are not yet opening uh, religious institutions, meaning that it's an attack again on the work that we are supposed to do to sensitize the masses about their rights and what they should do. So uh, thank you for that comment that actually a, a lockdown of uh, civil society is a lockdown of the nation because we cannot move, we cannot uh, meet our people in groups, in focused discussions, if we cannot be allowed uh, to open up fully. It's more like you have to seek permission to hold the meeting. Mm. And it's very clear, I have really read that time and again, that uh, we must find uh, uh, explicit permission from the powers that are in the regions. Robert Mugisa Awori uh, is the Senior Programs Officer in Charge of Advocacy at Human Rights Centre, Uganda. Thank you very much for that very insightful submission, Mr. Uh, Robert. Let me also bring in Sara Videte. Sara is the ED, a Centre for Constitutional Governance. Sara, Monica Atim has a question for you. She says, increasing democratization in socio and economic processes is a key uh, for growth and sustainability of the society. But then the question is, are CSOs catalysts or bottlenecks to democratization, Sara? from Monica. Yeah, I, I think civil society organizations, first of all, if you look at the, the aspect mm. of democracy, we provide information to the, mm. to the citizens. Mm. We do, I think 80% of civic education and vote education is done by civil society. Mm. But also beyond that, we work in other areas like environment, you know, climate change issues, to do with oil governance and protecting the environment, food security, and other areas. Mm. So yes, democracy thrives on information and action of the people. And civil society organizations are the bridge between citizens' participation and holding governments to account, mm. even in the, in the in developed democracies. So for every country to successfully democratize, they must protect the fundamental rights and freedoms of the people. And these rights and freedoms are balanced by civil society organizations. So I, I, I think even catalysts is a, is a smaller word on the role that civil society organizations play. Uh, because really, in a, in a, yes, because in a country where civil society organizations are not thriving, their democratic indicators are very low. And I, and I wish to quote the, 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 role, the, the speech made by the late Wapakaburo after the enactment of the constitution, when he was sharing experiences with Kenya, he was so hopeful as one of the godfathers of the constitution, mm. having steered the constituent assembly. And he did say that given the, the nature of the constitution we had enacted, all that Uganda needed to become a first world country was vibrant civil society. And, and if I may quote the words of, of Nelson Mandela, mm. if you want any significant development, you must co-opt civil society. There is no way around it. Sarah Pirete, 
um, we have more or less 12 minutes left to the end of this session. And let's talk about, about what government needs to be doing to ensure that they bridge that gap between the CSOs and themselves as government to ensure a safe working environment for your operations as CSOs. Go ahead. You know, one thing, what government needs to do is hmm. so, stop the hatred, stop the propaganda, do their duty of regulation, do their duty as, as they need to do their job and stop Indeed. the illegal things they are doing. Mm. So if you are, for example, police, first is a, the, the mind shift we are talking about is for government, the duty bearers. This idea that civil society are enemies, civil society are agents of, of foreign agents, I know some of the security people do it to make budgets and steal money from their organizations. They terrorize as if civil society are like rebel groups just to have budgets, operation budgets, and it's a corruption thing. So what the government needs to do is to do the right thing, stop the rise, stop the blackmail, Stop the propaganda. Civil society as citizens, there is no regard that we are doing. We are not agents of anybody. We are not seeking to do anything other than our set out objectives. And that's all they need to do. Mm. Yes. Sarah, can civil society organizations seek redress within the courts of law to compel government to create this safe working environment for CSOs? We have a number of actions where we have taken on government. Mm. We are using the available laws, mm. including the Human Rights Enforcement Act, including the Constitution and Article 50, General mm. Protection of Rights, and, and other laws. We are, I don't know how many public interest cases we have in, in, in courts of law. Safeguard our space. You know, I have to loud the CSOs. You took government to court over law um, funding of hospitals when it comes to the maternity works. We were losing so many mothers at birth. The CSOs did not act, uh, mothers who were giving birth. So the CSOs did not sit. They went to the Constitution of Court and compelled government to accord more funding to help facilities so that we do not lose more mothers. That's what we are talking about, the actual yes. role of the CSOs. Hmm, you're doing the most. Yes. Recently, we were in court to compare mm. government to stop the excessive costs of treating COVID. Civil mm. society has not failed to do their work in this country. Civil mm -hmm. society, as I said, you know, there's a, a bigger a statement that summarizes the work of civil society. The rich and powerful must not be powerful enough to buy the poor, and the poor must not be desperate enough sell themselves. Once you create that balance, then you have an equitable balance where nobody can buy you and you, you are not desperate to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. That is the balance that civil society seeks to achieve. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah Videti. She is the ED Center for Constitutional Governance. Let me also bring in uh, Elliot Orizawa. We're talking about what government ought to be doing right now to ensure a safe working environment for our CSOs moving forward. What will it take? Yeah, thank you so much, Romeo. Thank you, Sarah and Robert. Um, I don't know how we define government. Hmm. I don't know who has the right definition. But I think people who are in government are individuals like people who are in in civil society. Mm. I would want the government to go back and find out the reasons why they say they, they set research centers so that we can be able to go back and maybe be informed mm. from that perspective. We have think tankers, as we said before. Mm. Let government give us space for the think tankers to think and Thank you. advise. Mm. We mm. have uh, organizations or associations that are working on women rights. Let the government have a conversation to make the table grounded. Yes. We want the government to look at organization where Robert is coming from. I may not understand the language of the human rights defenders. Mm. I may not understand the, the, the language of a lawyer to know that mm. there are, they are clauses in constitutions. Mm. There is 42, there is 50. There are other clauses in the constitution. Mm. How do we expect the people that we work for to understand 
understand that there is the information that they can gain from civil society mm. to help build yes, government. Sir. If government say that they are trying to do things in a fair and just way, mm. and government say what we work towards is... Mm. Elliot development. Mm-hmm. And when we go back to the right definitions of sustainable, interrupting me on my on the phone, that has to, to, re, to repack and and we are say, mm-hmm. saying that we want to see the mm-hmm. future, and then you are killing the future now, then mm-hmm. it means it is not going to work for us. Mm-hmm. The government needs to come back to, to, to the first definitions of all those things and give us mm-hmm. space to work with them. There is one saying that we usually share with the with our own, with our fellow women that go to, to parliament. Yes, we shall tell them that you come from us, you will come back to us. And mm. we have seen people going to parliament and coming back to us. But one thing I want again government to understand is that the people who are in the parliament have their own civil society. They get money from civil society and get money from government. And if they come back to say, excuse me, you are doing wrong, what are they doing? Why should you get double, double salary? I see. And you don't want to come and you want to come back and say civil society, you are not doing the right thing. The last thing I want to mention is we are all going through uh, yes, Elliot. <laughs> We seem to have lost Elliot Orizawa, the ED Women and Girl Child uh, Development Association. Let me bring in, as we rectify that fit, let me also bring in Robert uh, Mugisa Abwali to talk about that issue. Social concerns because of the fact that the sad track that is coming that may take. Oh, she's back. Mm. Yes, Elliot. Robert Mugisa just pitching quickly okay. and uh, react to that submission. Oh, she's back. Hmm. Ah, sure. Elliot, go ahead. You have lost me again? Yeah, we had lost you, but can, you're, back, you're now back. We can now hear you, yes. Yeah, I just wanted... Robert oh, McGee, I just wanted to, uh, to talk about what is mm. happening now. Mm. Every household in Uganda has really suffered this COVID. Mm. Am I me? Can you hear me, Romeo? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, government, the scenario over over of COVID mm-hmm. and how different households have suffered. We have seen uh, mm-hmm. many people coming out to say the budgets in the hospitals are high, you know. But because yes, civil society was yes. talking, civil society was talking about these issues, about mm-hmm. the high rates in uh, in uh, health centers about high rates in uh, in, uh, in in the economy mm. and some people were quiet they were very and quiet and this is the mm. time they were very mm-hmm. quiet and this is the, and they were like civil society you are just making noise mm. why are you making noise but now the, the 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 noise was coming from the people affected so we don't want to go to that stage yes we want the government to make things clear now mm. not to fight mm. us I don't see we sh- I don't see the reason why we should fight. Indeed. If I'm saying government, I, we need to know how much money is allocated for gender-based violence because that is my area of concern. Mm. If I am asking, if I'm going to the community and I'm building capacity of uh, of women and and girls, and I'm telling them, look here, the government of Uganda has a budget, but there are mm-hmm. issues that government has not put that are going to affect you in one way yes. or the other. The government should shouldn't look at me as a uh, as um, as a terrorist. So for me, I think the government should a little bit rethink of where we started and then be able to start together. Because by the time you register me with my vision, with my objective, with my values, and then I tell mm. you my value is accountability and transparency. My vision is to see a dignified Ugandan, you know? Mm. And then you say, if you are saying a, a, a dignified Ugandan, maybe you are talking at, about a terrorist, then it means we can't work you, together. You want, you want to change the government. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not changing the government. I'm not changing talking the about government. a dignified, talking, of, talking about a dignified Uganda, for them, it might look like you just want to, to, uh, to change the government and come up with a dignified no. Uganda. They, because there's no. no dignity right now. 
No, not really. No, that is the question. That is the biggest question. The misconceptions from them. Mm. Yes, but 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 Romeo, what I'm talk, what I'm talking about is yes, uh, for for me, I don't see a reason why should government fight citizens mm. that are organized mm. to change mm. Uganda for the better. You know. All right. I, I saw myself the, the time when we were training uh, the, the voters, you know, when mm. we were training the voters and the voters were telling us, oh, we didn't know that we can, we can go on the paper and look at the picture of a person. For us, we thought <laughs> that we look at the umbrella and the, the bus, you know, that information is not bad. Mm. If I go mm. into a community and I'm trying to talk to this mother that, you know, mm. instead of fighting to your husband, sit down on the table and talk together, it means mm. I'm not a terrorist. But instead, what did we see? We yes. saw the shutting down of New Uganda over its operations yes. last year. Yes. If I mm. say that, look here, that we have a problem with double taxation mm. and we must really come out to talk for fair taxation. Mm. And then someone comes, you a terrorist. Why are you talking about taxes? <laughs> and, but you want Elliot to come and say, tell me. Okay, the me ED say, Women me and Girl Child yeah. Development Association. Thank you very there. much for that submission. I'm okay. telling you, if we go ahead bombarding the government over this, you can just go until the next day. Robert Mugisa Avori, is government li uh, living up to its name? A government of the people, for the people, and by the people? Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Romeo, for bringing us this far. Mm. Uh, I think the answer is no. It's not living up to the principles of democracy, government of the people, for the people, by the people. Mm -hmm. uh, what I really see is uh, when we talk about government, we are really talking about the executive legislature and the judiciary. Indeed. And my take is that uh, these people or these institutions or uh, arms of government must really work smart. And by working smart is by knowing their roles uh, so that they are not in any way intimidated. They are not in any way interfered with when they are doing their work. Because what we see right now is the controlling arm of one of the organs where if, if the other arm is to work, then it has to seek the authority of the other arm, which I call the executive. And therefore, working smart means can you stand your ground and stand by your values. Uh, the question of values comes back very uh, boldly uh, that the government needs to stand up to its values and principles mm. if it is to make progress and to mm. support civil society. The other thing is uh, let government think about the citizen, mm. not about itself. What we have seen is uh, anybody who gets appointed to a ministerial position to any government uh, agency uh, what happens is people think about themselves for this is to be human this is to be human they they if want I, to if, if, I was, if i was eating posha for lunch now i'll be eating a meal of uh, 200,000 uganda shillings and i'll forget that i was in yeah, the state of Pagmaya before that 200,000 could actually be used to support uh, mm. over a number of women and, and girl children essentially they forget where they came from uh, we could say that. Mm. And of course, God punishes people who forget where they came from. <laughs> because if you forget where you came from, you also forget the people that you left behind. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's what we need to do. We need to remind, constantly remind mm. government of its role, but also we call upon government. And uh, mm. this can be on record. Uh, government needs to think about the mm. common person, uh, mm. not about itself. Because at the end of the day, it is the citizens who make the nation. It's the citizens who make the country. If the citizens are happy, mm. then the nation will progress. If the citizens are constrained, then we shall see more deaths, we shall see more suffering, we shall see more outcries uh, by the citizens. And the problem is when we organize ourselves to speak, when we organize ourselves to petition, when we organize ourselves to move to parliament and call for change in policies, mm. then we are met with tear gas, we are met with the, the hard hand of the, you know, of the forces uh, that be. And therefore, we feel that um, unless, uh, unless we are seen as partners in development, mm. then the government is going down. It's going if, down. If, if you still have any more pointers when it comes to recommendations on how best government can work hand in hand with the CSOs, please share with us, uh, Roger. That is uh, Robert Mugisa. 
recommendations on how best yeah, government I, can create a safe working environment so that uh, CSOs can thrive and operate in a safe manner. Yeah, I think to add to that, I'll talk about the le legislation. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a number of laws that are very good for us, but also yes. there's need to amend and check those laws that uh, are used to curtail our work. When you look at uh, the government using some of the old laws, uh, for example, when, when some sections of the Penal Code Act and the Police Act were repealed, we see them coming back in other forms. When you look at the Public Order Management Act, which is still a constitutional debate, a constitutional court debate, and uh, the fact that some of the sections were nullified, we still see them being applied selectively against the work of civil society, against assembly, against expression, against association uh, by civil society. So there is need to revisit our, our laws. All right. uh, we have the, we have, we have the uh, Human Rights Enforcement Act yes. in place, but uh, who cares whether it is being implemented or not? Where are the regulations being implemented? Mm. If we have uh, advocacy efforts towards having a specific law of protection of civil society, mm. who is going to listen to us and mm. to care that uh, these laws pass for the protection of civil society organizations? I think that is some mm. area where we can Indeed. place emphasis. Very, very, very insightful conversation I'm having with these three panelists. Uh, thank you very much, Robert Mugisa of Wally. He is the Senior Program Officer in Charge of Advocacy at Human Rights Center, Uganda. Uh, Sada Bireta, you have a question here uh, from Youth Forum for Social Justice. Since we kicked off uh, this webinar a little bit late, it was around 2.16, so I believe we still do have some 10 minutes to exhaust this conversation. So here's the question from Youth Forum for Social Justice, uh, Sara Bireti. CSOs in the grassroots are facing a serious donor mistrust and most established institutions take advantage of the growing CSOs. Now the question, how can we widen the narrative for the survival of CSOs within the grassroots? Sara. I don't know whether I've understood the first part, Mm. But uh, the donor—they are facing uh, donor. What? Can I repeat it? He says CSOs in the grassroots are facing a serious donor mistrust. Yes. Yeah, and most established institutions take advantage of the growing CSOs when you're just starting. So how can we widen the narrative for the survival of these CSOs in the grassroots, those that are just starting up? Yes, I—I mm. I don't know what is exactly facing, but my mm. understanding is that donors prefer to work with grassroots CSOs mm. more than mm. CSOs in Kampala. Mm. So I think there is something different there. Many donors emphasize, even when they are working with Kampala NGOs, they want partnership with grassroots NGOs or prefer to work with grassroots NGOs because they, they are closer. It is, they are talking about something important here, that CSOs in the grassroots are facing a serious donor mistrust. That's what I'm one. Yeah, I, you get I, it now. I, I've got it. Can I, can I interject? No, no. Eh, uh, Elliot, you can first come in, then I will uh, say the overall because. Mm. Elliot. Yeah, I think uh, I have had I have had this uh, before. Before. Mm. But but I think what we uh, what that person can do can have a conversation beyond this. But the mm -hmm. most important thing is the donor wants someone who has built trust. Yes. If they have not built trust, we have seen again many mushroom, mushrooming organizations from local and, and national. Mm -hmm. But when the donor has not really built trust with you, they really don't understand what you are doing, then they will not definitely come to you. And uh, I think going forward is about trust building and knowing mm. what you are doing. And if it is true that you are doing it at that grassroots level. And, uh, so sorry, I can it. Yeah, I, I can build on that because I was yeah. wondering really what it is. Because yes. donors prefer grassroots mm. as compared to Kampala NGOs. And, uh, but what is, is facing is a mm. partnership relationships. You know, mm. donor partnerships are like our other partnerships it's like your personal friendship mm. you need to know the person you need to understand each other you need to build trust it is a journey of partnership building of network building that's why you said they monitor you for three years that, yes it does not happen out of the blue it, mm. it does not happen it's like a good friendship you must mm. invest in it mm. you must invest in, in it you must build the trust you must do what you commit to do 
Mm. Donors, you know, I, I think donors, I consider the, 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 their trust levels like a business of really trading tomatoes. And a small <laughs> thing like this, because if the, mm. a basket of tomatoes falls from your hands, <laughs> your business is gone. So any small issue can affect donor confidence and trust in an organization. And Indeed, it is sir. Not, yes. Robert, you wanted to pitch in? Yeah, it's the whole question of resilience. Mm. Resilience. Mm. Uh, I understand what that person is saying. Mm. Uh, that at the grassroots, of course, the question is, uh, again, mm. about who knows you and how do you get known? So mm. I would advise that uh, our colleague can... Uh, you know, he in Japan or connect with uh, organizations that have been there, he can inquire from uh, uh, our people who have gone ahead of us, uh, including Mama uh, Sarah Birete, to know how do we build up, how do we build up trust of the mm. donors, uh, because they will not really, they will not come to your village. How much money do you want here it is? No, it takes about, uh, it's about resilience. You to show a record of persistence in uh, standing up for human rights. And I think that's when they can come up and uh, be able to quote unquote shine in the nearest future. Zara Bireta, there is another issue here. Um, it's from Patrick. Uh, Patrick is saying CSO should strategize to support ordinary farmers to produce uh, for food security of children and poverty reduction and less towards governance issues that always bring them to knock heads with the state. Uh, Patrick is actually uh, pointing a recommendation whereby you expedite your work in a safe manner, focus on the farmers and not governance issues where you get arrested, where you get beaten up. What do you say about this? Patrick, there are several organizations working on food security. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Actually, governance has the least number of organizations because of the risks associated with it. Yes. We have very many people working on food security, very many people working with farmers, very many hmm. people. Again, I will take you to the constitution that civil society organizations retain autonomy on their set objectives. Hmm. If governance today is bad and it is affecting us as people working on governance. Mm. If we run away, it is going to get worse for ourselves, for our children and our country. So let everybody find their interests, their beliefs, their values, their niche and work on those passions, risks notwithstanding. Mm. Now, Elliot, what do you make of this? Yes, I beg your pardon. Yes, Elliot. A comment on what? Uh, the, the comment where, you know, uh, Patrick says that you should strategize to support uh, ordinary farmers yeah, to produce sure. food uh, for, and not governance issues. Yeah, uh, but but even in agriculture, there's governance. <laughs> it, it talks about a situation whereby yes, you are have, in a less risky position. Yeah. Mm. We have organizations that work on uh, uh, on agriculture issues. First of all, we have an organization, we have an association mm. called Food Rights Alliance. Mm an alliance, then you have an uh, organization that work on land and you have organization that work on climate change that is related mm. to agriculture. So um, they also have their concerns. Working mm. with government also becomes a little hard. Mm. Getting space, uh, giving your position, you know, it becomes hard, but uh, it goes back to the trust. It goes back to the trust. Mm. What trust have you, uh, have you built again with the donor? Because the donors will come but some of them will want to go to agriculture, some of them will go to governance. But again, as Sarah said, we fear going to governance because we don't understand the law language. Yeah. <laughs> we need to go and understand about the soil and what. But yes, I, yes, mean, yes. Uh, I think Patrick, mm. Patrick, Patrick is also, I think, telling, fearing. He's also bringing the issue of fear. <laughs> if mm, you are fearing, fearing governance, go to agriculture, but agriculture <laughs> also has issues. Yeah, All right, thank you very so much, bad. Elliot. Uh, Robert, what, ro what do you make of this? I just have a comment from Monica, but what do you make of this? Mm. About uh, going to farming? 
Yeah, but then Monica is also saying that it is important to maintain good accountability supported by strong policies that are followed to the dot. Actually, Monica is saying many yeah. civil society organizations still have their board members interfering in the management functions and donors withdraw when they notice that their internal governance is very weak. How true is this statement? But you can expand more on the first question. It could be true, but uh, one thing I should say is he who, come, he who seeks equity must come yeah. with clean hands. Yeah. I mean... If, if we are to preach the gospel, then we should be the examples. And uh, I think Monica is right because uh, civil society organizations, some of them have really been the problem. Uh, mm. And we have seen a number of them even getting closed because of accountability issues. And therefore we need to learn from accountable. Uh, I have uh, good examples of organizations that have been really to the point when it comes to accounting for donor funding and other resources that they uh, they get from their memberships. So it's important that uh, the board, the management uh, and the staff hold on to the values of uh, governance, the values of accountability, if we are to call the government to account, because we cannot seek uh, a clean government mm. when civil society is also, you know, uh, getting dirty. It's our problem. Uh, that means yeah. that... Uh, even if, in, even if any person was chosen from civil society to join government, then we expect that that would be even a worse uh, government than the one we are condemning right now. So mm. it's very true. We must hold on to the values of accountability and support one another. Mm. All these sectors work together to contribute to the economic development, mm. to the human rights development of our country. So let's work together and share information that can help us build uh, a stronger Uganda. And of course, my message to the three of you is not to cower, but you know, to stand your ground and continue fighting for the citizens of this country. The people are voiceless. So if you, the people who are supposed to speak on their behalf, decide to keep quiet too, then there is, that is a recipe for disaster. Um, I shouldn't let you go without talking about how COVID-19 has affected your operations. Not only the government is suffocating you, the pandemic too. Sara, how has it affected you in the Minute. Well, working in a lockdown, we have been working on o online. I think mm. it's only two people that could do access mm. office during lockdown. And it was very expensive because staying at home is very expensive. I don't mm. know how other people usually find it. It's so tough. even the increasing domestic violence, when you have everybody staying at home, you tend to spend mm. more money at home than you would originally mm. spend. Mm -hmm. So we had to, to put in a data allowance for staff to make sure oh, everybody nice. can keep online, mm -hmm. not relying on them to buy their own data. So that's but, how we manage but guess, it. But guess what government is doing? They are leaving a 12% tax on data, suffocating I, business, <laughs> business traders, suffocating our students who would have continued their education on the internet. Seriously. <laughs> Yeah, so we know it would be, we knew it would be expensive to keep yeah. everybody online, and that's mm. how the only way we are working. Mm. So we had mm. to incur that cost as, as an, that cost as an office mm. to keep some of the digital activities and digital mm. advocacy running. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Sarah, your last parting shots to the beautiful citizens who have been listening in and watching this session. What of advice? Well, my comment, my comment, oh, remarks are that we are most of us really other than a few people who have dual citizenship mm. uganda is the only country we call our home mm. i don't have dual citizenship i don't intend to seek i was born here this is my mm. country yes. so my my call is we are all eco citizens in our country nobody is a superior citizen nobody should put you down Nobody should tamper with your rights. Mm. Let's claim our rights. Let's claim our dignity as a country. Let's work for the posterity of this country. Thank you very much, Sarah Birete. She is the Executive Director Center for Constitutional Governance. She comes with a wealth of information. And uh, next week, um, yeah, Sarah Birete, I'm putting together an interview where we should expound more on this conversation. Maybe on Tuesday, you should meet me right here in the morning at NTV so that we can talk more about the shrinking civic space in Uganda. I believe we had two hours, but guess what? I want to continue 
although up to like six, but then we do not have the time. And then because I, I know Elliot has to be somewhere, Robert has to be somewhere, and of course the beautiful people who are watching this session. So we shall expand more on this on Tuesday. I shall bring in Jackson Kafuzi, Sara Pirete, with whom we shall spy on set. Elliot yeah. Orizawa, final parting shots to the beautiful people who are watching. Wow, thank you people who are watching and those who joined us on, on Zoom. Mm. Uh, it has been a good conversation. Mm. And um, I want to call upon uh, those who are working with civil society organization, but even those at the universities and schools, that they shouldn't wait to join such a conversation that this at the stage of when you are working, but start from the universities. We can build the ground and we can be able to know that it is us to change Uganda, it is us to reduce on the inequalities, it is us to end poverty, and uh, together we can. Thank you so much. Do you know much. what I believe, Elliot Orizawa? That if the government hadn't clamped down on the work of CSOs and NGOs, we wouldn't have missed out on those over nearly 10 million voters who did not cast their ballot uh, or, yeah. or their vote in the just concluded election. Meaning yeah. there was no information dissemination from the CSOs yes, and right. NGOs tasked with monitoring of the election. So that's why we ended up with over uh, nearly 10 million people yes. not casting their vote. Right. But thank you very much, Elliot Orizawa. And I do wish that you continue your yeah. work with the tenacity that you are showing or uh, espousing right now. Thank you. Robert Mugisa, final parting shots to the beautiful people who are watching this session. I really want to appreciate the people who have been uh, online and uh, following the discussion. Thank you to Romeo for mm -hmm. moderating us very well. It's a pleasure. Uh, what I would like to say is there is no civil society without uh, the civilians themselves. And uh, our role as uh, the voice, uh, as advocates of human rights, is to continue looking out for these issues in the society. Mm -hmm and talk about them. If we talk about uh, issues like um, civil society leaders being arrested and detained without any charge, without any cause, but for the cause of uh, fighting for rights, then we shall not keep quiet to the very point when uh, our lives end, we should be able to stand and speak against the evils that touch society, that touch the common person, that touch us as uh, living beings. Uh, all of us are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That's our message. And therefore, whether you have a lot or you have nothing, we all to the same level of life. We are all living beings. And therefore, the question of human rights, the question of uh, growing together as a nation is very fundamental. And therefore, we need to watch out for each other. We mm. need to help one another to rise. Mm. Uh, it doesn't help for one generation to grow big and the other one is uh, frustrated. Mm. Uh, I think uh, it's a clear message, all of us and the uh, people who are watching, that uh, each of us is a human rights defender, each of us is a civil society act, each of us can mm. do something to contribute to the welfare and, uh, of our country. And of course, empowerment is important. We continue to design programs that empower uh, the communities to speak out uh, for their rights. Indeed, I couldn't be any more exalted. I couldn't be, yes, any more honored to have had this conversation with you, Robert Mugise, Elliot Orizawa, and Sarah Birete, at this opportune moment when the shrinking uh, civic space is actually getting, uh, getting very, very, very worse here in Uganda. Thank you very much for the work you're doing, and I pray that you continue uh, pushing harder. Please do not lower your guard. Sarah, Elliot, and Robert, and all the CSOs, wow, and all the partners you. who have been watching and listening to uh, this session. Thank you very much for well, having made the time to actually join in and follow these proceedings. My name is Roman Basuk. Of course, yes, a uh, recorded proceeding uh, will be uploaded on, uh, on the internet, on social media, so that those who had missed out can actually go ahead and uh, watch it again. And also, Sara Bireta, do not forget Tuesday. I'm bringing in Jackson Kafuzi to expand more on this conversation on the shrinking civic space in Uganda. Sara, Elliot, and Robert, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day.